the Koran. I'm reminded of Luke 16 where there is a uh, rich man dressed in purple and fine linen living in splendor every day and he dies and finds himself in Hades, tormented and begging for people to go back and warn them. I think the Pope is in that very situation. But what did he actually believe? What did he actually say, this Pope John Paul II that was just buried? We know that he believed salvation was not in Christ alone, and therein is another gospel that damns. But let me ask the question, what did he believe about Mary? In Christ alone, we heard it and we sang it. After the death of his mother, when he was eight years old, Carol Wojtyła, that's how you say his name, the Pope that died. After the death of his mother when he was eight, he developed an intense devotion to Mary. When he became Pope in 1978, he formally rededicated himself and his whole pontificate to Mary. He traveled around the world making visits to numerous Marian shrines around the world so that he could uh, venerate her in the fashion that c Catholic theology calls him to, that's hyperdulia, which is a higher dulia or a higher veneration than for angels. His example and his preoccupation and his devotion to Mary motivated thousands if not millions of Roman Catholics to make Mary the primary focus of their lives, the primary focus of their prayers. He had a papal crest developed and uh, it was a simple coat of arms and in the middle was a huge M for Mary. When he died, his coffin was decorated with a large M. His personal slogan, which he embroidered into all his papal robes in Latin, totus tuus ego sum Maria, I am totally yours, Mary. Totus tuus ego sum. By the way, those are the opening words in his last will and testament. And in that will and testament after devoting himself to Mary, he said, I place this moment, referring to the moment of his death, in the hands of the mother of my master, totus tuus. In the same maternal hands I leave everything and everyone to whom I have been connected by my life and my vocation. In these hands I leave above all the church and also my nation and all of humanity. He put His own life, the church and the whole world in the hands of Mary." That is ridiculous. That is ludicrous. He says, each of us has to keep in mind the prospect of death. I too take this into consideration constantly, entrusting that decisive moment to the mother of Christ and of the church, to the mother of my hope." That's paganism. That would nauseate Mary if she knew about it, and she doesn't. She never heard a prayer from anybody, ever, neither did any other saint. In notes included in his will, John Paul II quoted the words of a former Polish cardinal, victory when it comes will be a victory through Mary. And if you closely followed the preaching of this man, you could see that intense devotion to Mary in a message to the general audience uh, May of 1997. Uh, John Paul said, and I quote, the history of Christian piety teaches that Mary is the way which leads to Christ. When an assassination attempt, you remember, failed in 1981, I think it was, he credited Mary with saving his life. On the anniversaries of uh, that assassination attempt, 1992-1994, he made special pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady of Fatima in order to offer ceremonial prayers of thanksgiving to Mary. He wrote a book, John Paul II's book of Mary. The ad copy inside the book says, the book is for people, quote, who seek a deeper relationship with Jesus and His mother. And the table of contents lists all the titles that the Pope applied to Mary. Gate of Heaven, Mediatrix of All Graces, Mirror of Perfection, Mother of the Church, Mother of Mercy, Pillar of Faith, Seat of Wisdom. Let me just tell you what some of the things in the book say. I'm quoting him. Mary shares our human condition but in complete openness to the grace of God. Not having known sin, she is able to have compassion on every kind of weakness. Not having known sin. Why then in her Magnificat did she call God her Savior? He says, she understands sinful man and loves him with a mother's love. Precisely for this reason she is on the side of truth and shares the church's burden in recalling always and to everyone the demands of morality. 
He says, for every Christian, for every human being, Mary is the one who first believed, and precisely with her faith, faith as spouse and mother, she wishes to act upon all those who entrust themselves to her as her children. And it is well known that the more her children persevere and progress in this attitude, the nearer Mary leads them to the unsearchable riches of Christ. And again, here's this whole life of effort and effort, and you're trying to get to Christ, and you can't... trying to get to Christ, and it's hard to get to Christ, and Christ is a tough guy, but He can't resist His mother, so you get to His mother. And and she gets on his case about you and you get in. That's it. He says further, according to the belief formulated in the, do in the solemn documents of the church, the glory of grace referred to in Ephesians 1, 6, is manifested in the mother of God through the fact that she has been redeemed in a more sublime manner. As Christians raise their eyes with faith to Mary in the course of their earthly pilgrimage, they strive together to increase in holiness. Mary, the exalted daughter of Zion, helps all her children wherever they may be and whatever their condition to find in Christ the path to the Father's house. Father's house is just really hard to find. Christ knows the way, but you can't get Christ's attention, so you work on His mother and He can't resist her, and that's how the whole deal works. He further says, nobody else can bring us, as Mary can, into the divine and human dimension of the mystery of the gospel. Let me stop here and say, Mary has nothing to do with the salvation of anybody. This pope wrote, we can turn to the Blessed Virgin, trustfully imploring her aid in the awareness of the singular role entrusted to her by God, the role of cooperator in redemption, which she exercised throughout her life and in a special way at the foot of the cross. And this new pope, Benedictus XVI, Ratzinger is his uh, given name, in his first statement as pope said, I place the church and myself into the hands of Mary. Both of them make Mary responsible for everything. If you go to Catholic churches around the world, I've been to them all over the place in the world, you'll see the paintings or the decor, and at the top is always Mary. Rarely ever God, image of God, rarely ever Christ, almost always Mary. What about, what about the issue of salvation? How did Pope John Paul II view salvation, being a, an informed Catholic? Well, he was a modified universalist, okay, a modified universalist. He stopped short of saying plainly that he believed everybody in the world would eventually be in heaven. But he used the phrase universal salvation hundreds of times in his writings. And he often expressed uncertainty about whether any human being would ever really go to hell. In a message to the general audience in July of 1999, the Pope said this, "...the images of hell that sacred Scripture presents to us must be correctly interpreted. They show the complete frustration and emptiness of life without God." So he transports hell into now and says hell is just a way to describe living your life now without God. Rather than a place, this is his book, this is what he, or what he said in his speech, rather than a place, hell indicates the state of those who freely and definitively separate themselves from God who is the source of all life and joy. So hell is uh, your life now without God. He went on to say, quote, eternal damnation remains a real possibility. But we're not granted without special divine revelation the knowledge of whether or which human beings are effectively involved in it. We have no idea who's going to go there. It is a possibility, but we have no idea who's going to go there. And then he said this, the thought of hell must not 